Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on this episode, we're very excited to have Mr. Conrad Pope, very famous Hollywood orchestrator and composer, with us to chat a little bit later on. But first, first we do want to look at a couple of headlines. Uh, so, for starters, we um, got a great article we got linked to. John Williams is talking about the music uh, for the upcoming Star Wars Episode 7, along with possible music for a possible Indiana Jones 5. And as uh, you may know, Disney, of course, now owns all of those franchises. So there's been some recent stirrings about a development of another Indiana Jones movie, which they had been laying low on for a while because Star Wars was Star Wars and the Marvel movies were all the, the talk of the town. But uh, also, Kevin, the last have... one was terrible. Yeah. Well, there's that. Too. There's, that. there's the sort of apology mo- filmmaking move, which should hopefully um, help us to forget the last one. But we'll see. Um, and Kevin, any cool things about the article, or we should just send our listeners on our way? Um, yeah, they can out. go check it out. We, like you said, we'll have a link for it. This is from Inquirer.net. Um, he talks a little bit about Star Wars Seven, a little bit about Indiana Jones Five, and a bit about the book thief and also um, just kind of his general process and approach and, and, and that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's worth checking out. Okay. Um, there's a new, a new sort of report about how audiences for concerts featuring film music, or in some cases just concerts of film music uh, are growing. And uh, so again, that article will be linked to our website. You can check that out. Um, Also, we've got a nice link of the top 15 scores of 2013. At least, I would say, top 15 as IndieWire rates them. So you can have a chance to, again, check that out. See if you agree with those. And see if there's a few that you think should have been on the list that weren't. Um, Kevin, why are there 114 film scores that are eligible for Oscars? Why not Uh, 115? I I don't know. It's, 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 I think, it's based entirely on... Um, clearing all the proper paperwork and things like that. I don't think this is a pool of scores that was at all limited by any sort of judging. It's just these people are the ones that filled out the forms on time and that kind of thing. Um, Included in the 114 scores that we should mention, by the way, uh, is um, the score for Tim's Vermeer, which was composed by Conrad Pope, today's guest. Um, A little shout out for Pope. Yep. Um, we've uh, also got uh, an article from the L.A. Times um, mentioning um, or, or at least highlighting uh, four four film scores uh, of of the year. And so we've got like we've mentioned here, we've got a couple articles um, really starting to get into the all the speculation and things about award season and which, what were the best scores of the year and which ones are going to win awards and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. This is just uh, another one. Um, the four scores that they mentioned are John Williams, uh, the book thief that we've talked about quite a bit. Stephen mm-hmm. Price's score to gravity, which I think we talked about in our last show. Um, yes. Hans Zimmer's score to 12 years of slave, which is actually not one we spent much time on. And Thomas Newman's score to saving Mr. Banks, which just came out maybe a week or two ago. Um, so anyway, just kind of a, 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 those four scores as a cross section, um, all wrapped up in this idea of, you know, what, now that we're coming to the end of the year, what are the, the strongest scores that we've had? Um, speaking of that, it was, I think maybe within the last week or so, uh, the Grammy awards, uh, have been announced or the, excuse me, the nominations for the Grammys have been announced uh, included in the best score soundtrack for visual media, we have Alexander Desplat's score to Argo, Craig Armstrong's score to uh, the Baz Luhrmann Great Gatsby, Michael Dana uh, for Life of Pi, which won the Oscar last year, John Williams for Lincoln, Thomas Newman for Skyfall, and Alexander Desplat for Zero Dark Thirty. So the um, and this is something I think we actually talked about uh, around this time last year. It seems like the way that the calendar for Grammys is lines up is very different than a lot of the other awards. So many of these are scores that we would have said were from last year, nominated yeah. this year. Um, so anyway, just kind of uh, interesting. Well, I, I just think, you know, it's obvious that Alexander Desplat just needs to quit writing so much music and scoring right. so many movies that get nominated for things. 
So he's right. got two in there. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Uh, see if any of the, the Oscars or Golden Globes weigh in on uh, the chances of, of which one of these might win it. So right. anyway, but we'll have the link if you want to check out more about that uh, yep. at our site. Um, now, I was going to make a comparison because the the L.A. Times article that we just spoke about a second ago, which highlights four scores, kind of says it, they approach it from the standpoint of, hey, so if in case you forgot – there is a contribution of music to film, and and here are four films that have a notable contribution of its musical score. And so they highlight the four that Kevin named a second ago. Um, I think it's an interesting contrast because we found another article that describes sort of um, something that, and, and at least the way the article positions it, is more of a negative approach to what's uh, happening with the use of synthesizers, or at least the title is fairly provocative in that. It's simply yeah. called Synthesizers Are Killing Film and TV Music. And uh, so, again, we've got um, a link to well, what is it? The Guardian. The Guardian yep. has an article. Uh, it is by um, uh, Dahlia um, Al- Albridge. Albridge. And um, so, anyway, check that out. Again, uh, as you'll hear it mentioned, it'll be actually referenced by name by Mr. Pope during the interview. Uh, check it out. Read it. See you know, see what your take is on it. Can you think of a film right offhand that is all synth? Or can you think of a film that's a mixture or something that was orchestra and you wish it had been synth or something vice versa that was all synthesizer and you thought, well, that was lame. I wish that would have been orchestra Uh, because uh, there can be a lot at stake from the sounds that composers choose to realize the music they create for a score. And then sometimes they pick right on the money and other times maybe you think not. So uh, yeah. check that out. It, it's, it is interesting because the, the main – well, the, the couple of main points from the article are that uh, this is becoming more of an issue because music budgets for film and TV are shrinking. And so whether they want to or not, composers and producers are having to live with a synthesized score just because there aren't budgets to hire live musicians. Um the other thing that's mentioned in the article is, and kind of like you were alluding to, Bill, that there there have been lots of scores, um, that wh- where synth ha- where synths or samples things like that have been used really well. So it's not necessarily this idea that they're always bad. It's I think more that that composers are having to live with them more. The the one thing that I would add that I didn't the article didn't really bring up. But to me, it is is an important issue, is um, how synthes- how how working with samples and synths, not how it's affecting just the um, the final produced product, but how it's affecting the actual composing process for composers who are writing using samples while they write, uh, because that, to me, the, I, I I hear a big connection there. I, I look at. You know the sample libraries that I use, and I think about okay, which samples work well really easily, and which samples don't sound very convincing. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, the, the the biggest the the issue that I think you find with samples a lot is are the attacks. When you have a good sample, once the attack of the note has happened. A good sample is going to sound fairly realistic. It'll be strings with vibrato or, or something that sounds very realistic. It's the attack from one note to another that usually gives away a sample. Um, so if you're a composer writing a score that is going to be produced with samples, how can you avoid that? Well, how, how can you avoid the, effect, the idea that the attacks are going to, get, to give it away? Well, you write long, sustained notes where you don't have many attacks – or you write a lot of percussion instrument where each attack is oftentimes going to be on, you know, from one instrument to the next. You know, you have a whole set of toms, one note is going to be on one tom, one note's going to be on another tom. So you don't have the all of the acoustic issues that happen say on a violin when you have a player who is sliding on the fingerboard from one pitch to another cuz that kind of transition thing samples aren't good at. Um yeah. So anyway, my my point is that I think what you what you're seeing in a lot of these scores that are produced where the final product is samples is it's not just that the final product consists of samples is that the writing process itself was done 
um, based on what is maybe most convenient with the samples. And to me, that's that's kind of the big issue that that we're running into. It's not that the final product is all samples, but it's that the creative process, the compositional process, is so so heavily influenced by using these tools. Um, which I, I think is, like I said, maybe a conversation that is is outside of the extent of this article. That's that's kind of just what I. It sort of got me thinking about having having read it. But um, yeah, we'll have a link to that article uh, up as well. You can take a look. Yep. And then I was going to say, um, after all that you just said about samples and writing for the samples and making them sound good because it's convenient. I was going to say, and that leads us right into our final headline, <laughs> which is that Hans Zimmer has, we think, revealed the new theme for the next uh, Spider-Man film, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which, of course, we had mentioned last time that it was sort of abruptly announced that he's going to be scoring it and not James Horner, who scored the first mm-hmm. one. So there's a website where, well, we'll have the link up to it as well on our site, and you can just click, and it is basically taken, I think, some of the background music of one of the Sony websites and just remove that music or strip the music out and then they just play it for about a minute or so. So um, we're not having a podcast episode devoted to dissecting Hans Zimmer's maybe, maybe not theme, but rather we'll just leave it at, here's the link. You can go check it out. Disappointment to to fans everywhere. (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, they'll get over it when they see the awesome interview with uh, Mr. Conrad Pope right so anyway so that'll kind of take care of the headlines um i did want to talk a little bit about uh some things i've had a chance to listen to and then and then kevin and i did want to talk briefly about the the hobbit sequel the desolation of i I like saying smog but everyone's saying smog which just sounds weird you gotta say it right abnormal well (laughs) i'm not british and i don't own any of the books so i can kind of claim ignorance and go about my life normally but anyway I know uh, what I'm buying, Bill. Was that fish. a nerd burn? <laughs> I think it was. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to say that I did catch The Hobbit um, in theaters, and I did have a chance recently to see uh, Hitchcock's uh, the film Hitchcock. It was about a year ago, but you know I can't see everything in the theater, so I got this. I rented this one, and it has the Danny Elfman score, um, where he's uh, channeling uh, a lot of Bernard Herrmann. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say the one scene in the film where they hired an actor to look like. Uh, Bernard Herrmann was not as good as it could have been. And I wish they had <laughs> a little better job with that. But they did show Hitchcock enjoying the part of the shower scene by standing outside the theater and listening to the crowd scream inside. And none of that would have been as cool if Danny Elfman was not allowed to use Bernard Herrmann's music in the, in the Hitchcock movie, which is another way of saying that movie and that scene would not have been nearly as cool if Bernard Herrmann had never composed sure. The shower scene music, anyway. So in the way, there's a sm- it's like a small tribute to great film music in the midst of a film that's essentially a biopic about Alfred Hitchcock. But it's it's excellently done. It was a charming little film, and I enjoyed it. And the score worked well. So Kevin, what have you been listening to this week? Uh, the, the two things I've been listening to lately are uh, John Williams' "The Book Thief" score that was released uh, just a couple weeks ago on CD, I think. Um, and then Howard Shore's score to to this newest Hobbit movie, um, both both I think are what you would expect in in really good ways. I mean, um, Howard Howard Shore's score it it fits together very well with all the other scores he's done for the the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit films, as you would expect. Um, we get some new music for. The Mirkwood Elves and Lake Town and, and some of the new places that are, are visited in this film. Uh, the the Book Thief, uh, again, I think expectation is right there. You know, we've talked in the past uh, about the kind of categories or the genres that John Williams lives in. You know, he's obviously um, big adventure stuff. He's great at. Um, there was a time there when he was doing a lot of maybe you know, in the 80s and 90s doing a lot of more comedy types of things, which was a, a, a different sound than, than his big adventure stuff. And then for maybe going back to, uh, I guess maybe Schindler's List is the first thing that comes to mind. He kind of does these smaller, more independent period piece type films. 
Although I guess it can go back to, you know, Jane Eyre and some of the things he did in the seventies now that I think about it. Um, but the book thief is very much one of those. It's, it's, it's kind of one of those period piece war film, but small personal story kind of thing. And, and, mm-hmm. um, so if you've heard his scores to Schindler's list or Angela's ashes or, um, Again, films in that genre, this or um, Memoirs of a Geisha is another good example of that kind of thing. Uh, this music, what's that? Seven Years in Tibet. Seven Years in Tibet, another really good example, absolutely. Um, any of the films where he has Yo Yo Ma playing is kind of <laughs> the category that I'm talking about. Um, Fair enough. But no, it's, it's, it's so, again, it's exactly what you're, you're expecting. Um, I mean, it's, it's, he's just, He's just really good at that kind of thing, you know. There, there aren't many people who, um, who can just kind of turn it on and off from one genre to another and be sort of that consistent. Um, it did strike me as the kind of score, and I don't know. This is necessarily a bad thing, but um, you know, he was hired because this was a film where you wanted some of those John Williams moments, kind of, and and you get them. Um, I don't, I, I, like I said, I don't know that that is necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just the way it works out. Um, but you know, I would, I would certainly recommend listening to them and it seems, you know, this is the first Williams score we've had in a while that wasn't a Steven Spielberg movie. Um, so it's not super often that we're getting to talk about new John Williams scores, but it seems like when we do, they they are largely staying the same, but yet becoming more and more different from the other scores that we talk about around them. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, let's talk about the Hobbit score then, uh, sure. since that's sort of got a um, uh, a wide-reaching theme for today's episode because of the interview with Conrad Pope later on. Um, you know, I, I thought there was an interesting parallel be- between this and the original trilogy in, in a moment where they introduced the Lake town, I distinctly could hear. And of course, for those that may not realize it or may not know, uh, Howard Shore's approach continues in the, the Hobbit desolation of smog score to be very thematic, uh, to be very, um, light mode. Uh, yeah. Uh, in that the Hobbit theme is brought in very sparingly, but it's, it's still in there. Um, and I felt that, you know, I actually, I can't think of any, huge moment where I remember any other large scale callbacks to Lord of the Rings themes necessarily, but I'm sure, sure there was like when the orcs are. And, and there, there are a couple of moments um, with the ring where you hear the kind of, well, the, ring, yeah, of course, siren the ring. song. Yeah. yeah. No, the ring, the ring was good. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed, there was a couple, well, not, I mean, these, these aren't really spoilers, but there's the ring has a moment or two. And it was sort of nice to revisit. I liked hearing that theme again. And mm-hmm. and um, anyway, I don't. I want to try and not make this a criticism of the movie because I had some issues with the movie and and all of that. And and it is still basically a children's story that he's kind of like dressing it up and propping it up on these sort of stilts that can't really hold it up because he's trying to make it like an adult, a darker kind of thing. But anyway, uh, that's all right. So you can. We can complain about that in the talk back, I guess, or something. I don't know. But um, but the, I thought the music was, you know, it functioned fine. And it was, you know, all the correct emotional support. But if I could make, I guess, a minor squabble. In the second Lord of the Rings film, The Two Towers, the most notable new city that they go to, I guess the newest environment, would be uh, Rohan. Uh, at least that's the way I remember it. You have the, yeah. all the new, the, the you know. The, the big city on top of the hill. Yeah, I mean, you've got the king, you've got the slimy Grima worm tongue character, you've got um, the all the people who are the horse lords, right? Yeah. And okay, so to me, in this movie, uh, Lake Town kind of was like that. And I know I shouldn't compare it in such a, a literal um, kind of um, you know comparison kind of way, just because oh, when he got to Lake Town, it's a different setup, but it does have a kind of a king figure, and it does have a slimy very Grima worm tone looking uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of henchman guy. Um, and it does have a lot of people, but they're not necessarily all good at something like riding horses. They're just good at, I guess, surviving cold weather and living essentially on the water. 
but I mean, there is a there is sort of a light motif for or a, or a theme for that town, and I I kept hearing it, and I I kept thinking how much I wished it did more, or how much I wished it was a little more memorable or remarkable, and yet the town was a little bit drab and wet, cold, damp, not really a place I want to hang out in. So in a way, I guess his theme was it was had a, kind of a rhythmic bounce to it, but. Anyway, I'm not trying to get all hung up on this one thing, but it just kind of seemed like it was almost the way these Hobbit movies are not quite as magical in some ways as the Lord of the Rings films. In some ways, they could cut out some mm-hmm. more here and there. And, uh, and the music kind of seemed like, well, it goes along perfectly with that. It's not quite as magical, maybe, as the original scores. But then again, um, I, I, I want to give this a little bit of time, and I want to actually go back and see it again listen a little more closely. Um, but overall, I did in- enjoy it. I enjoyed the score. And there were more, to me, overall, more was done well than not. So I was putting a lot of emphasis on that one because it stuck out. But the, the throw- throwbacks to the ring and then the general scoring. And I love the, um, the, the kind of underscore in the forest um, mm-hmm. with the eight-legged creatures i don't want to give spoilers but anybody knows the story they know what well, the book's is. been out for like 80 years you're not going to spoil anything but they're cgi and it's different this time <laughs> okay anyway anyway i thought that was really well done and it reminded me but in a totally different way of how howard shore approached the cave of shelob where he just like went into horror music mode and he was like i know this is a this is an epic but i don't care i need to frighten the viewers right now and create some really scary music. And when they go into the forest, all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's it's a whole different approach. But, I, I mean, different orchestration, different. it was different kind of use of textures, different use of the orchestra, um, did different colors, which, of course, may have been from the collaboration with Mr. Conrad Pope. But uh, really cool, really effective, and very memorable. And it stood out as a great uh, sort of musical set piece. Yeah. So anyway, so I really enjoyed it. I thought the Hobbit score was was good. One for the, um, you know, one for the books. Kevin, yeah. what about you? And and uh, you know, I think I think you're right. It you know, really, what it comes down to is when you look at the past fifteen twenty years, I, the Lord of the Rings movies and Howard Shore's score to them have kind of been one of the the pinnacles of film music. And anybody who's interested in film music. Um, is certainly going to be interested in listening to this score, and and like I said, I, I don't like I said earlier, I don't think they will be disappointed at all. I think it it's it's exactly what you expect. It it fits right in with with all the other epic um, Middle Earth music that we've gotten from Howard Shore, and and I think that's probably a good thing. You know, five movies in, it's it, it's pretty solidified by this point, which which is good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, so we want to uh, shift over to – well, actually, before we shift over to the interview, um, there, all this, the soundtracks that we're describing right now, uh, whether it be The Book Thief or The Hobbit or even um, uh, like Thor Dark World, these are all out now and they're all available. And I'll give a much more extensive layout of some new releases in our next episode because with, with the new year, there will be a lot more CD releases as well, both from the – sort of Christmas shopping season, but I want to wait and sort of collect them all. So I'll give a better update of that in the next episode. Um, and without further ado, let's, uh, let's show our interview with Conrad Pope. So we're really happy tonight to have Conrad Pope speaking with us from Los Angeles. Uh, he's actually in his wife's studio at the moment, um, which I wanted to ask you about in just a second what your wife actually does, because I see all the plaques behind you. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, one of his most recent credits is working as orchestrator on The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, which is currently in theaters right now. And if you are not familiar with his work, he has quite an extensive uh, body of work that is as a, not just an orchestrator, but also as a composer in recent years. And even on a previous podcast, we did talk about uh, Tim's Vermeer. Wait, did I get the title right of that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And I believe my week with Marilyn also. That's mm-hmm. correct. Okay. So um, this is a, a gentleman who is very busy in the industry, and we're very thankful that he's taking some time out to speak to us tonight. So, Mr. Conrad Pope, thank you for joining us on Streamers and Punches. 
Well, it's a real pleasure to be here with you, Bill and Kevin. And, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to uh, always talk about something I love, which is namely film music. And it's always a great thing when you can do for a living the thing that you love. And so it's also great to share with you and your audience, uh, whatever I can. Yeah, well, so, we're happy to have you. Yeah. I'm, so well, I'm, I'm, I'll just jump in real fast and explain. I'm in my yeah. wife's studio, as you said in the introduction. And that these plaques behind me um, are all of her uh, Grammy nominations. And she's won a Grammy for her uh, arranging for Natalie Cole on Still Unforgettable. And this particular year, she was nominated for two uh, Grammys for a work on a instrumental arrangement for Amy Dixon uh, that Chris Walden uh, conducted for Sony Classical. And Amy Dixon is this uh, hot saxophone player right now. I mean, hot in terms of classical being in demand. <laughs> of course. Say, yeah, so please, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> And also uh, for her work for Arturo Sandoval on a Latin album where she um, uh, arranged Arturo's uh, song for John Marco. I forget the young man's name, but it's a vocal arranging. So she has two Grammy nominations. She's quite an arranger, quite a jazz, um, quite well known in the jazz community. Well, as we'll start talking about... It's Nan Schwartz, by the way. Her name's Nan Schwartz, I, I should say. Oh, okay. okay. Well, um, so maybe at some point... In your work day, you can explain to her what is going well and what's not going well, and she can empathize <laughs> on a level that that peer professionals can. Uh, yes, because uh, in, in her and another one of her lives, she was a uh, she wrote for TV, and until recently, along with Bruce Broughton, uh, she was the only person to be nominated for I think three Emmys in one year, and finally Jeff Beale joined them. And so she's, uh, she, and she's from a showbiz family. Her father was the uh, man that made the, Glenn, the uh, Glenn Miller sound. He was the lead clarinetist. Willie Schwartz, very famous with people that followed Sinatra and jazz and things like that. And her mother sang with Tommy Dorsey and was a studio singer and had such hits as Chicago, That Toddle in Town, and Sunny Side of the Street. And so, yes, it's quite a musical fest here. I have someone I can always share the miseries and the <laughs> triumphs of this particular profession. Well... I'd I'd like to keep asking about her, but unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> you you are our subject for this evening. So uh, again, um, I actually I just wanted to dive right in. I didn't want to steal all the Hobbit questions since that's probably the most the uh, well that's, the most recent. That's what people want to hear about. So let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so Kevin and I were definitely wondering if you could just sort of describe your involvement with uh, the Desolation of Smog and. Um, well, well, first, let's start very broadly, and then we can kind of whittle it down to some other, like, nuts and bolts, as you like to describe it. Um, but, yeah, I'll just let you kind of take it from there. Well, I, I, I guess it was last April I got this uh, uh, phone call from Paul Brusek, who was president of music uh, for Warner Brothers. And he had mentioned that uh, they were exploring a different way of doing uh, the score this year uh, to Schmau. And he called me up to say, uh, would you be interested in perhaps being part of a team that would um, orchestrate and conduct and various things for Howard Shore? And I was quite surprised because, as you probably know better than I, Howard is very, very famous for being a one-man band in, in terms of these things. He tends yeah. to yeah. orchestrate, conduct, and do all these shows. And it's been quite a, a remarkable undertaking, one must say. I mean, it's just the hours of work and music that he's done. And so I said, well, sure, I'm, I'm more than willing to sort of been talk about this. I don't know what I could do. And so that set in motion a thing. Of, I went back to Tuxedo to see Howard, I guess, in June. And we talked about it. And I think that uh, what the plan was this year was that um, I think Howard wanted to basically concentrate on composing and uh, doing uh, what he does best, which is write this uh, unique music that he's crafted for the, this entire series. And if I just put an aside here, uh, you know, he's managed to create a unique sound world, I would say, for Hollywood, when you think that so many people have to compete with what John Williams has set a standard for, namely these imaginary universes. And when you know what John does in uh, outer space to, uh, the, to England and the little castles of Harry Potter, um, Howard in, has managed to etch out a unique sound and a unique way of handling the orchestra. And so there were many challenges there that we can perhaps talk about later. But um, but in any case, it was sort of thought, well, it would be great if Howard could be writing and concentrate on writing and then have some other fellow 
uh, like me, but not necessarily me because they've also looked into some other people, um, uh, come and sort of do the sort of uh, laborious work of putting things into the parts of the orchestra and then going and conducting and making the performances of it. And so uh, I said yes because I think it sounded like a great challenge and it sounded like um, a lot of fun and um, as or as fun as these things get. Uh, but let's not be too <laughs> put too many growth. I mean, it's Satis no, say it's satisfying. I know, as I often tell people, you know, about the thing about the movie business is that when you get a job, say yes, yeah, composer, it's kind of like receiving a letter saying, um, "Oh, the good news is you've re received the job as a composer. You've you've, uh, you've won a swimming pool." Uh, the bad news is they give you a shovel to dig it with, and so that's the. Uh, and so once you get the job, you're very happy, but then you're handed the shovel, and then the work really commences. And so that's basically how I got involved and um, and uh, set up a communication with uh, Tuxedo and Howard and uh, Peter Jackson in, um, in New Zealand, and I was sort of brought into uh, Howard's uh, circle, if you will. And uh, became familiar with how Howard has worked in the past and what his concerns were, and, and tried to sort of gather how best I could serve him and serve the score and serve the movie and serve Peter Jackson and have it uh, be as successful as we could possibly make it. Did you uh, start to describe the involvement of Skype a little bit before we started the interview? And I was wondering if you could jump back and describe some of the how and how deceptively simple some of the interactions you guys were doing with the technology. Well, no, it was, yes, what's great about Skype is that um, uh, Howard and um, How Howard and Peter Jackson, um, they Skype. They basically Skype, and that's how the spotting sessions took place, and they would Skype by looking at the movies. And, and uh, I was actually sort of surprised um, for all the technology, they would still, uh, as we used to say in the old days, finger sync. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, the things is that they go, we're now going to play... You know, the, I, I can't even remember how they described the cues, but it would be something like MR one two six three six zero three nine three nine, and then in three, two, one, and then, so, <laughs> you know, it would just be like. And you know, earlier this summer, I was called in <laughs> on um, uh, the Butler Lee Daniels, the Butler, and so when we were doing these various consultations back and forth on that particular picture. Um, Lee Daniels and I, and, and, the, and the music team on that at first, uh, I, I ultimately did not participate in that film, but I, I did initially take a look at it and talk about music with him. Um, I, we, we used this thing called CineSync, which is out of Australia. It's this massive program, and so we had, uh, we had one session where the composer was in Portugal. Uh, I forget the, name, the man's name. I think it was Lau or something. Um, he was in Portugal. Lee Daniels was in New York. I was in Los Angeles. And we could just do it, and it was very high tech. And I just was amazed that Peter Jackson with 3D green screen, <laughs> uh, Weta, all the, where they even gave me my own a Wi-Fi network because they were concerned about security in, in New Zealand, that they were still finger sync. <laughs> I, that's funny. You would think if they would have had an excuse to spend money on some kind of technology thing like that, they would have jumped at it. But I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you know the thing is that like I was saying I'm very old school I think that's actually why maybe Howard and I first got along is that Howard's pretty old school too and so um, all of us old school guys are we still got our fingers but not yeah. necessarily <laughs> could you talk a little bit um, I, I guess with relationship to, to, to Desolation of Smog but I guess also in a more general sense I know Peter Jackson is kind of notorious for a film really not being locked until it absolutely has to be done. And as I know, cause you were the conductor on this score as well, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering that seems to be a more and more common situation that the, the composer may not get the luxury of writing to a locked picture. And I'm wondering as an orchestrator and as a conductor there at the session, how, how do you have to kind of manage that? Well, I think that it's, uh, yes, I think the term that they now use is that a picture is never locked, it's only latched. And that's the term that is, pe people tend to use. And certainly with Peter Jackson, when you realize that uh, today, it, film has always been a technical medium, and film music too is a technical medium. Uh, and, but certainly these films, when you know that when you get 
when I first started looking at this, it looked like a bunch of men in Halloween costumes in front of green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all. It looked covered it looked, in dots. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I kept thinking, where, where do you have your bag for the candy you're going to go get? <laughs> it was just, they just had this, uh, it was just very odd to look at um, because everything had to be constructed. And, and when I saw how much, because they, they, if you're doing stereoscopic cinematography, um, at 48 frames, the machines are like sizes of little refrigerators, and they can't haul these cameras up to locations, so they have to create everything. And so one of the problems is that not only is it not locked, actually they don't know what the scene is. They don't know what's going to all be in the scene. Now that the film is out, I can talk about the, the coins, say. Yeah. Uh, when they finally get to uh, Schmaug's lair, that it's your, the, 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 I forget what, the Lonely Mountain, um, where the dwarves' kingdom is, is that the, all those coins were actually, they're all animated, even though that they had tons of coins made to see what people's feet would do when they went down them. Um, everything was sort of all in green screen and totally animated. And so it takes a great deal of imagination. And one of the problems is that Howard's writing, he knows what the story is, he knows the broad outlines. And then as we get closer and closer to the day, um, more details are filled in. And then um, when you finally get to the scoring date, that's actually the first time that you might even see something that even resembles the finished film. And so there might be, you have to do touch-ups and, and you have to respond sort of to what Peter Jackson needs at that particular point. And so it's a very difficult thing for all concerned. Very difficult. And uh, yeah, it takes a lot of imagination and a lot of hope. Yeah. Howard's done it quite well, I must say. Because it seems like he really understands these films and really knows what to do. So my next question would be, um, you described uh, having kind of an old school approach to orchestrating. Does that mean that Howard would come to you with something like a condensed orchestral score or even like a, a large piano um, a grand staff or two staves and then uh, have like little notations for this will be woodwinds, this will be strings, and then have a, a kind of a sort of a shorthand with you and you knew what to go from there, you knew what to do? Or would he give you electronic files? Or Well, what's funny is that with Howard, it's all the above. Uh, if I could just, oh, okay. I don't know if I'm going to, um, you know, be revealing family secrets here, but I think that they're not bad secrets for people to know if they don't. And I think, uh, you know, sadly, I, I've read some of Doug Adams' first book. That, in fact, that was one of the, you know, they sent over this whole course and Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings because I must have been, the only person uh, on the planet that had really not seen Lord of the Rings um, because I'm just so busy. And so uh, that was, I, that's why I was just so astonished at all like this. Um, uh, but I was a quick study and I had the scores and I had Doug's book. Uh, but um, Howard's process is sort of an old fashioned one because we, like I used to talk about um, in the old, now you get synth mock-ups a great deal. But when I first started out, I used to orchestrate um, for James Horner. And James was always notorious. He would just sit and play the piano. And I'm so old school because this is how I learned to conduct. This is how I learned to do music. I would have to score, read at pianos and whatnot. When I hear somebody play the piano and give a performance, that tells me so much more of what I think the music should sound like because I know the expressive mm -hmm. direction that it's going. And so Howard is kind of old school in that he still plays the piano. But his process was that he would sketch at the piano. Then that would go to James Sizemore. And James Sizemore would basically be tasked with doing the mock-ups. And so it's really a Sizemore, there's a, there's a sketch one would always refer to that I would always start with and look at, of Howard's. <clears throat> but there was what I would consider more the, uh, since these things are more known these days, what would, people, what would be like a John Williams eight-line sketch. Um, though it's not like John Williams at all. I don't mean to actually make the comparison in a certain way. Um, then I would get, really from James Sizemore, a, an electronic mock-up that Peter Jackson heard that was constructed from a Howard sketch that James would then realize electronically. And then from that electronic sketch and from James's, or, and actually from Howard's uh, sketch, there would be generated almost a kind of pretty a nice score that one would say would be kind of what I call pre-orchestration. Because ultimately, uh, orchestration has something to do with the colors, of course, that one does in the orchestra. But it's actually more technical than that to the degree of that you actually have to put something in front. 
if you look at the union book, orchestration is clearly defined and very simply. It's the person who determines what the players will play. And so from that, which you might get, might spew out of a computer, where flutes never breathe or trumpets never breathe and violins uh, find an added C string or something, (laughs) well, off the instrument and scoots down to where they should technically be a cello or maybe at best a viola da gamba. Um, When you see things like this, you have to determine the parts. And sort of that's when I sort of come in. And also the idea of the synth balances quite handily, immediately. And, and, uh, and this has been going on for many years now. And so the real task was to sort of sit there and say, this is the sound they want. How can I do it so that when I drop the downbeat, the orchestra will balance itself? And what are these dynamics and what are the articulations and what are the things that make what Peter Jackson's gotten used to hearing? Mm -hmm. um, What's going to make that happen? And so the very first day of recording, we had all the heads of all the studios showed up. It was the NZSO. People had warned me that, I mean, before I went down there, I really, the only time I'd been to New Zealand before that, they flew me 26 hours for a 45 minute luncheon interview with, Peter Jackson to see if who thought that I was going to be okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then they flew me back. And so when I first went down there, I, I you know, from some of the horror stories, or the, and they were unfounded. It's sort of like uh, people at the turn of the last century making up stories about people that must live on the moon or Mars. They would say, oh, you know, I, the, the orchestra is going to show up on tractors and <laughs> all these things. <laughs> they, they don't. You know, sometimes they don't have electricity in New Zealand. And you're going, wow, really? Is that true? And uh, <laughs> on the very first day, we read through like five or six cues. I, or, I shouldn't say cues. Um, Howard very correctly thinks of his music as pieces of music rather than using the norm- nomenclature that we have here in Hollywood of, of cues. And so we read through five or six pieces because I didn't know what I was doing. They said, get up there and conduct the orchestra. And fine. So I got up there, and we just I just started waving my arms, and we started going through all the pieces. And there was the head of Warner Brothers uh, Studios, uh, Ken Tashahara, I think. I probably have the name wrong. I know Toby Emmerich was there. The, all the press. It was like a big show, pony show. Like, is this going to work? And I kept, I didn't have my headphones on, no clicks, no nothing, just wildly reading through all this stuff. Um, and I'd talk to the microphone and ask Pete Cobbin, how's it going? Silence. What do you people want to hear? Silence. So I kept going, 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 and I felt really <laughs> quite isolated. I felt like I was in on the beach or something, that a bomb had taken out everybody in New Zealand except me and the NZSO. And then we took a break, and I went down, and Peter Jackson said, sounds like Lord of the Rings. I think we're in business. This sounds like the what I wanted it to sound like. This is takes me back to the first picture. This is where I want to be. I think we're fine. So then my anxiety was actually relieved because up until then, uh, silence is not generally one of these encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I kept thinking, well, you're down here. They're sounding okay. We'll go. And so after just basically a day of trying to read through a lot of the music so Peter could hear what had happened, what we'd done, if it was going to work, um, then we set to work the next day. Was this was this done primarily because the process had been different this time because it wasn't Howard Shore orchestrating everything? Well, I think that part of it has to do. Uh, it was yeah, part of that. I think that the major thing was that last year, or the year before this, with Hobbit One, it was actually the first time Peter had not been in the same room with with Howard. Mm. That you know, um, Peter was always. Um, working in New Zealand, Howard was recording in London, whereas here in California, you know, my days over there were basically from 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. most of the time, because, you know, what is it, Um, uh, California in terms of New Zealand time is like five hours ahead of New Zealand, but a day behind. So if I got up at, if I got up at 3 a.m., on Thursday, I could talk to my guys in California at 8 a.m. Wednesday. 
And so, uh, that, so I had to always be running that kind of clock. But between London and New Zealand, it's basically 12 hours. It's half a day away. So if if Howard if you know if Howard were recording like at seven p.m. at night because he would always keep New York time in London, if he wanted to get Peter, he'd have to have him at seven a.m. Mm-hmm. And so that made the the process of really t- communicating very difficult. And so this year they decided, you know, Peter has to be in New Zealand to to edit. We have this schedule because. Again, you know, call me crazy. I don't quite realize why things always have to be the last minute. Like, I, <laughs> like I, as I told Peter, it seemed, um, remind me of high school when, you know, you sort of yeah. sit there. And you're like, <laughs> Reminds me of a lot of my students doing a paper the night before. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and like I try to tell people, um, that to me, that's not the best thing. But that's how the business has changed. I mean, if anything else, it's kind of like, I think it's going to get worse like this, but that's that's an aside. So, I think the reason we worked this way is that it was much easier to have Howard stay in New York, do his thing, work very hard, and then have a, a surrogate me um, be in New Zealand and be able to be hands on all the time with the director and with the film and with the people, and basically take care of that whole business of music production. Mm-hmm. After he composed it, just be sure that we do. And, of course, it was very difficult because, as I told Howard, um, there's quite a legacy here to live up to. Um, I, I, and, you know, forgive me if I talk too much and don't give, permit you enough questions, um, and I'll just shut up in a second. But that was the real challenge, was that, and that we didn't know if we were doing it right every day. Uh, I said, mm, what, what will Howard think? Mm-hmm. That, was, that was the only question we had in our minds. But he seems to have been pleased from the outset as well. Well, you mentioned a second ago uh, some of the changes in the industry as it relates to just the sort of the last minute uh, preparation. But we were kind of wondering, <clears throat> from your observational viewpoint, what's been some of the changes for you as an orchestrator? Uh, I guess uh, how your involvement was with a film, say, 25, 30 years ago, when, of course, we were kids growing up with, yeah, you're baby. These are the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and then versus what your involvement is now. How you know? Basically, what are some of the the most drastic changes, or what stayed the same? Um, I would say overall, the, the biggest change is that when I when I went into orchestration, my goal in life was not to be an orchestrator. I I came to uh, film music. Uh, Kind of late, I guess. Uh, you know, I was like 30 years old when I came to film music. We had, I'd been an academic before that. I won't bore you with that. Um, but it was a skill that I could use to, in order to get a foothold in the business. And when I first came here 25 years ago, that's about how long I've been here, um, is that I, what it was was that orchestration to Phil call what Phil Ailing once said, a great uh, core anglais player, English horn player, whose uh, work can be heard on the very first time. Born on the 4th of July it was the first time I ever heard Bill, uh, Phil play. But Phil says, orchestration is anything you say yes to. And in the early days, what I would say is that orchestration was always kind of this um, catch-all thing of that sometimes you would do, there's no more, I would say we tend not to be ghostwriters anymore. Um, but in those days, that was something that could happen. Um, is that you would be hired, uh, one of my first jobs, I was given two bars, and they said, make three minutes of it. And so what you would do is that you would be basically the ghost writer or the ghost arranger or whatever for things, in addition to maybe taking full-blown sketches that were quite complete and do those. Or as you said earlier, Bill, these um, sometimes people were very good with the piano, but not very good with uh, hearing the orchestra, which was more common in those days, like 25 years ago because uh, the technology was so poor, um, and you would have to flesh those out. That is no longer the case today. One, uh, there's very little ghost ride. I'm very seldom ghost ride for anyone, except somebody maybe uh, within knocking range of my generation. Uh, but there are fewer and fewer of them actually composing like they used to. Everybody... Um, has to produce demos. Most of the ghostwriting takes place really with the people that make the mock-ups these days. Mm. 
So if there's going to be ghost writing or ghost arranging or ghost whatever you want to call it, in other words, things that no one wants to know about or hear about or, you know, why take away? Like I tell most people, this is the movie business. It's a business of illusion. And so uh, we get much further if the illusions are maintained than if they're dispelled. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a big magic show. Um, but those things are now taken over by uh, the people that do the mock-ups. And we are so key to the mock-ups that there are basically two kinds of composers. There are the kinds of composers, and one is, uh, I won't name names, but is very highly successful, perhaps the man that's dominated and defined what it means to have these kinds of superb mock-ups. Um, when you work for him, you basically copy exactly what they've done in the synthesizer or the synth the computer that shows my age synthesizer. Um, and so you do exactly what's there, and it doesn't take very much. All you have to do is basically do some basic dynamics. You just do that. Then there are other things that I'd say more like what this job was, where I would say they had a very good orchestral sound, but it wasn't necessarily how the synthesizer that you don't necessarily, it was, you know, you don't necessarily, you get an orchestral sound by just having a lot of brass and a lot of wind. I mean, a lot of brass and a lot of strings. But that's not what an orchestra is. At least to my, if you hire me, I'm going to try to write something that's going to sound reasonably orchestral, uh, that's going to engage the players in front of you, that's going to be something that's uh, conceivable as a, a, a nice, okay outing for the players, because the players are the real judge of the orchestration, I think. And I write for people to play. Um, and so, then there's this other kind of orchestration, like I was going to say, where you don't just copy exactly what the sequence is, because that's highly dangerous, given... For, so that's another... That's a technical topic. <laughs> uh, but I then try to make it... I get the impression, just like I was telling you earlier about someone playing the piano, I get the impression of what this music is. And then I go, well, really, it's true that you have horns here, but you really also need to sail this... You need to have, like, the oboes and octave and you had to feel it. You do these various things that makes you still hear the horns, but there's something brighter about them, or there's something that helps that muddy or the uh, thick uh, chord that's in way down low that's very sinister, that's getting in the way of you hearing certain things. Well, oh, this will help propel the horns over this morass that's churning underneath. And so I always seek to make things work acoustically right out of them. That. And I think that's probably because of my years with John Williams, because with John, the whole thing is that if it sounds good acoustically in the room, it will certainly record well. Mm -hmm. mm. And then also, also Howard, even more so than John, I suppose, at this point, he wants these things to be taken on the road. You know, he wants his scores to have a life of their own uh, in Australia and throughout the globe when you project the picture and play the score. And so there's an added, um, I think that's a responsibility as well. Make it good. So again, sure. sorry, sorry for going on and on. I should let you ask some questions. No, that was pretty thorough because it, it covered um, a lot of the music that I enjoyed as a, as a youngster growing up and then the approach to how you sort of realize it nowadays. Um, no, it's extremely fascinating. I find it really, really interesting because if, I like the idea, the good rule of thumb, that if it sounds good in the room, then it'll record well. Because other times, I've I've always wondered, this sounds so good on the on the album. Is that because that they just they just played it and then everyone fixed it in the room with the with the board afterwards, or is it really actually pretty good from the you know from the downbeat all on its own? And and so it sounds like. Some projects are that way and some aren't, but you want to work towards the ones that are and get them to sound pretty solid so that there's less adjusting later. But, uh, well, yeah. I, think that you, I think, well, you either have, like, like what I'd like to emphasize with, with Schmaub, as opposed to um, uh, many people I work for. In fact, the, the prevalent thing is that with Schmaub, we got up there, went boom, we all played. You play and you play. Everybody, we all play. Now, the many people these days is that a friend of mine, um, Tom Calderero, told me 15 years ago, he said, Conrad, we're not in the music business. We're in the recording business. And there's some <laughs> truth to this because many things are stemmed where you will sit there and you'll make a stem of the strings, stem of the brass. And if they still remember what woodwinds are, maybe they'll put those into the strings because <laughs> they don't play that. 
And sometimes, but but with Golden Compass, for instance, we made a stem of the brass, a stem of the strings, a stem of the woodwinds, and a stem of the percussion. And and even though you know, I'm very proud of my work. I, I try to I try to do the best work I can, no matter what the composer is. I always try to say, "Who are you, and what do you do?" Um, there's something uh, I don't want to talk myself out of a job, but it's also changed why you don't need orchestras and you don't particularly need people like me at, the, at this particular point. Um, if what you do is just assemble these things at the board, namely strings, almost anybody can write for, no doubt about it. They sort of blend themselves. Next are brass. Brass, you know what? They can find a balance. You can screw up in terms of register, but not, they'll do something. Woodwinds. That can sound like you've set fire to the San Diego Zoo if you don't. <laughs> what you're and, so, uh, and I think that's also why people tend not to write for those things because the samples are so poor. Yeah. As well as that, it's highly treacherous. You know, one C sharp on an oboe right above middle C, one of the worst notes in the world for the thing. And, but if you hit that, you shouldn't have that. That should be in the core. Of, X, Y, and Z. And so, but now I just say, if you're, you're stimming things out, you don't need an orchestrator. Because guess what? You can fix anything. Yeah. Because you can favor. And so, again, with Schmauk, what's great about it, for me, just as a professional, um, this is, for the most part, no funny business. This is what it was in the room. And uh, there were much of edits for generally intonation. Um, because, you know, we recorded probably three hours and 20 minutes of music, three hours of music that's probably represented somewhere. We, I know we orchestrated over uh, three and a half hours and then had to be re-edited for various picture changes and whatnot. Um, so it was a massive undertaking. Um, but that's another, that's how things have changed. Is that in the old days, you got hired as a, the way how you could be, get hired was that if you showed up and they played your chart down, as they say, and it sounded great, you're hired again. <laughs> These days, and you, you could build up a reputation as, as an orchestrator by people who go like, that guy will save you money. Yeah. You don't have to fix a lot of things with this. You know, your, your stuff shows up, it sounds like what you wanted it, and don't, you don't have to mess with it. That guy's okay. These days, it's kind of like, we don't care, okay? Strings, okay, great, we'll fix that. Okay, boom, fix that, boom. Fix. So there's no way of actually uh, people knowing what you can do because they don't need that much done. I hate that almost sounds... Way, you know, but, okay. I was just going to say, almost the way that CGI has become such a, a mainstay in even films that that aren't necessarily needing it. Um, it seems like they can fix a lot of things in post-production with computer graphics. Sometimes uh, it almost sounds like a parallel to that. Oh no. I mean, if you see again, it's one of those things. Well, when I first got, I remember when I was doing student films over at USC, if you saw the boom mic come down, you know, like the mic was here and there's a, like the shot was killed. I mean, like, and, and the guy, the guy holding the boom, the boom guy was fired, you know, immediately killed and sent to Siberia, you know, like you'll never work in this town again. Now it's kind of like an invitation to incompetence. Like, Oh yeah, we saw the mic. We'll, we'll take, you know, we'll take it out. So the boom yeah. guy can sit there and be not really attentive and, I, you know, I, I guess it shows my age. I, I, I always feel that it invites not being concentrated because, you know, like, is it ever really that serious? Yeah. We'll fix it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and that, that actually, it, it sort of brings me back to that question about dealing with a locked cut. It seems like because there's so much flexibility with those types of things, not only for filmmakers, but in the, the music process as well seems like nobody has to make a final decision about something it's i was i was watching just not too long ago the um the john adams hbo special with paul giamatti and there was some shot where he's on horseback and somewhere along in the editing process they decided he was like riding a horse towards the woods or something and they said you know it'd be really nice if instead of riding his horse towards the woods if he were riding his horse towards Boston. And they just took out all the trees and put in 18th century Boston. And it's, you know, it's great that that flexibility is there, but from, again, especially from a composer standpoint of wishing you could have that locked cut and you can't, it's, 
it seems like, like I said, it just gives that opportunity for people to not have to make up their mind on something. And that seems well, like it could get frustrating. Oh, no. it's a, To me, well, it also has changed what I tend to say. It's also changed the type of personalities that are drawn to the business. Walter Murch, in his book, I guess, um, the, the, the Mind's Eye or the Seeing Eye or something, he says that, uh, he, and, it's, and it's a very good book, because both things, he says that when it was analog in film, it was like sculpting. You had to make a decision, pick up the hammer, wham, the stone comes out, that <laughs> chip's there, and you're committed. And you have to keep going with that stone. Today, digital is like clay. Mm. You can work, and then change your mind. What's good about the stone is that you've got to make up your mind. You have to have a clear vision first. And as one of the composers I used to work for uh, said, Oh, it's kind of like a marriage. You commit to the person. You commit to the project. You commit to the film. You commit to an idea. And and the trouble with that commitment, it's like Don Giovanni at the end of the opera when he shakes the stone statue's hand, is that you go, we're in this together. And I've got to do my best. And, and by God, if I don't do my best, we all sink. And so there's this kind of thing of that it has to be great. And that's what it used to be when it was like really physical, had to lock the film, had to make cuts. Ann Coates, the great uh, film editor from uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, God rest Peter O'Toole, um, she said that she would look at the footage for weeks before she'd make a single cut because you had to do something destructive. Sure. And you started to put the thing together. And, you know, and if you think about people like John Williams, who spend so much time with, with their themes, and then they... C- you know, they spend a lot of time on other things, but then when they start composing, every day has to have so many minutes, and so you're always screwed up to the highest performance level. It's where composing becomes like performing. You go, it's only going to be as good as I can make it this day. Mm-hmm. And so there's a kind of, you're forced into it. The computer can can foster bad habits, I would say, which is that, oh, I'll fix it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. How bad can it be? Well, you know, we'll stem this and come over. I mean, there any? You get flexibility. You can change your mind. You can do a bunch of things. But the major thing is that commitment. Like I, here's my deal: is that I keep thinking, one of the we're going to finalize this one day. And I can't. I won't mention the picture, but say if you're on a big picture, and cuts are and changes are happening up to the very last minute. You sit there and go, what's going to be in this picture forever? was not something we thought a week about. Yeah. It's something that's my best idea in the last 20 minutes. And we've affected that right now. Mm. And that's what's in that film. <laughs> and really, you go, this journey, this journey of blood, sweat, and tears has ended up to, and like a jazz musician, uh, you know, it might be, it might be one of these things where you go like, God, Bill Evans was great that night. Guess what? There are nags. He wasn't that great. <laughs> Not every eight bars is going to be that. And you sit there and go, shouldn't this have some consideration? So it's very tough. I mean, yeah, it's changed a great deal. And I'm never comfortable with it because I keep thinking big moments should have a lot of consideration. But sometimes that's not what this job is anymore. This job is we need a great moment right now. And you sort of go, I gave you a great moment, but is it the best moment? Well, yeah, yeah talk to tell. So, are you interested in composing more of your own original scores? Uh, in, and are they satisfying, like on a on a whole different level, or a much or different? You- yeah, you know, yes. And the short answer is yes. You know, I've spent um, and you know, like recently, I did this Tim's Vermeer, and that was highly. Um, unusual because of the people that hired me, Penn and Teller, Teller told me, do anything you want, do what you think's right. You never hear that in the film, in, in the feature film business. It's only an independent thing. But yes, that's what I'm interested in doing. That's what I've always driven to do. But it's, um, it's very tough here. And particularly if you ever get known for doing something well. Like when I first started out, the way how I got started was that I did what they call takedowns and sound alikes. And so people that were quote unquote hummers would hum things or play something into a cassette deck. In fact, 
like I said, I was doing MIDI transcriptions before there was MIDI. When I first was starting out, I was transcribing stuff for Richard Gibbs, who was doing the first uh, Simpsons season and various things like that. I worked for Richard for a while transcribing his MIDI by ear. And that's even that's a whole other topic. But nonetheless, I knew I didn't want to get known as a great transcriber because they don't need, you know, you'll get stuck there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and so once you become, an, once you have the kind of reputation I have, as an orchestra, you get doing that. Uh, what people tend not to know is that I do conduct. Now they seem to know. Uh, uh, but again, because you get so pigeonholed. Because that's how the business works a lot better if they know that they can go to that aisle in the supermarket, pick up cornflakes, and that decision's done. So it's, uh, you know, maybe I've uh, sat at this table too long, but uh, it seems like I might have more opportunities to compose, but I can only hope. Uh, Tim Vermeer has been doing very well for me, and, um, and we'll see. We'll see. Good. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've we've spent a lot of this interview talking about kind of how this job has changed and how the process has changed, and I'm wondering if we could maybe just finish up, um, if you could, if if you could put into a few words, maybe where you would like to see the job of an orchestrator go, or how you you wish maybe the process changes in the near future. Sure, I I have a very simple thing, you know, it's. Funny, like on Facebook, I put something up that was like from um, the the Guardian in the UK, which says synthesizers killing film and TV music. Yeah, and we're, we're going to talk about that article later in our show. So, oh, well, so, <laughs> like, I, I mean, I just put it up, and I thought, well, and I said, well, here's a hornet's nest because yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I just couldn't believe that for the first time I saw something on Facebook that had more comments than likes. And like 93 likes, and it's down to it's up to like 163 comments, <laughs> fighting tooth and nail. And I don't know what it's about because here's where I'd like to see things go. I'd like to see things remain one that music's the most important thing, and I don't care if you're doing uh, a Blade Runner, which I can't imagine it with an acoustic score in a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Or if you're doing Tim's Vermeer, where I can't imagine it, it was a chamber score. It's not for real, you know, it's for like Dumbarton's oak size orchestra. Um, because it's about a guy and it seems like acoustic instruments with real people and a small thing. That seems right, Tim. The major thing is to be a good musician. Know your craft. Know exactly what things are. Wake up every day knowing that the great gift of music is that there's something you can learn that day if you're attentive and have your ears open and your imagination on, you know, running on on some sort of motor. And that I just fear that uh, my my angle on the computer thing is, is another thing, which is that there's always the horror story about how the machines will become like humans. But I would say after my experience in Hollywood over these past years seeing this, now, the great fear is that actually we're going to become more like the machines because we've become tempted to do what the machines do easily for us, whether or not it's mousing, because we our phrase out here is mouse composer. I, I can generally see when I've got a score by a mouse composer because of the duplications of things that you can just see that are highlighted drug here and drop there and blah, blah, blah. And if they made no mistakes there, that's the other thing. Um, composers today uh, don't necessarily have enough of a performance background. And I would, uh, for orchestrators and composers, I would always say, always remember, you, your responsibility is to be just like a performer. Performers don't get rewarded for playing wrong notes. Please don't write them. Uh, please really look at your stuff before you turn it over. Please know that you have an obligation to be as right as the violinist playing your part. You have a number of obligations that are all musical, and that as long as we train people to be musicians first, Film music will always have a bright future. It's only when we start to define music by what is done easily for us by these new artificial means that we will lose uh, a lot of our humanity and a lot of probably what what we uh, drew us to music in the first place. And that's why so many concerts these days, don't you find it amazing that most concerts are filled with music written 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. of film music? 20 and 15 years ago. And I just offer that as another hornet's nest. 
<laughs> and that's a long conversation, but as you can tell, I can probably talk forever about a ton of things. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, that, that with that answer, it's a, a great place for us to let you go. Um, I just want to thank you once again, Mr. Conrad Pope, for joining us here on Streamers of Punches. It has been a huge pleasure. Um, we would love to have you back in the future, I'm sure. Um, yes. So, yeah, thank you again for being here with us. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure. And, and thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Dave, for engineering this. And thank you for doing what you're doing because I think that, I teach in Vienna in the summer, um, these classes. And what I will say is that I used to not believe that music was a universal language. Film music, I think, has changed my opinion. I think that it's the one thing that sort of binds the world. It's remarkable how the rhetoric of film music has spread. And there's great film music being written everywhere in the, in the world, and everywhere in the United States, not just Hollywood. And so thank you for spreading the word and keeping it alive and a community that I think is always engaged. So it's been a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you, Mr. Conrad Pope, for that interview. That was awesome. And we had such a fun time talking with him. It's great. Um, so that is going to do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. Uh, you can listen to us on soundnotion.com tv slash sap where you can subscribe to our show leave comments and find links to the music that we spoke about you can also subscribe to the show through itunes my name is bill witham and i'm a kevin wilt and we will see you on our next show take care <laughs>